Okay, I think we're gonna get started here. Um, hi everyone, my name is Joey Katz. I'm the program associate with Boston Jewish Film and uh, we're thrilled to have you all joining us today for our second to last uh, virtual program, part of the 33rd annual Boston Jewish Film Festival. Um, we're thrilled for tonight's conversation, um, all about the film Stettlers. Um, we're really excited to have uh, the director of the film, Katya Ustinova here, um, and uh, Debbie Cardin from uh, Action for Post-Soviet Jewry, who will be leading the discussion. Um, hi to both of you. Hi, Joey, thank right. you for having us both. Yeah, yes. our pleasure. Thank, um, thank you so much for having me too. <laughs> yeah, our pleasure. Um, so a little bit about tonight's guests. Um, Debbie Cardin, our moderator here, is the executive director at Action for Post-Soviet Jewry. Uh, a little bit about uh, Action for Post-Soviet Jewry. The organization has worked with Jews in the Soviet and former Soviet Union since 1975. And I believe you're uh, stationed in Waltham, correct? That's correct. Great. Um, so Debbie has, uh, she completed her undergraduate uh, and graduate studies in social work at Syracuse University. Um, after a career working with at-risk homeless and street teens and young adults, she obtained a master's in religious education and leadership from the executive master program at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. For the past 25 years, um, working with the Jewish community, Debbie has been a successful congregation camp and youth group professional developing progressive teen leadership and Israel engagement programs. She also teaches, as if that wasn't enough, she also <laughs> teaches Holocaust classes at local synagogues, including an innovative multi-generational -gener model. Wow. <laughs> um, and Katya Yusinova, uh, the director of Stettler's, is a Russian-born documentary filmmaker living in New York. Prior to switching over to documentary filmmaking, she's worked as a producer, host, and reporter for almost 10 years for a major Russian broadcasting company in Moscow. After moving to the US, she got her MFA degree in social documentary from the School of Visual Arts in New York in 2012, along with receiving a Paula Rhodes Award for exceptional achievement in documentary filmmaking for her thesis film. Over the past several years, she has been working on three feature length films covering very different themes, stories, and characters. As the other two films are still in progress, Shetler's is her first completed feature length documentary. We look forward to seeing those other two down the line. Um, <laughs> so uh, welcome Debbie and Katya, and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Joey, thank you. Um, so Katya, it was an amazing movie and um, you just capture every essence about the living in, in, in the shtetl um, from the past to the present and um, the, the, way, the, the way you seamlessly go from, um, the, from Ukraine to New York and back again and from the past to the present is, is just was just amazing. What, what inspired you to, to tell this story? It's such a, it's such a um, under, you know, it's the work I do. So I know how difficult it is to explain this story and not many people know about it. What inspired you to take on this, this story and, and to tell, be a storyteller for this particular story? Um, yeah, thank you, Debbie, for these kind words about the film. So um, it, it all started with my father, who created the Museum of Jewish History in Russia in Moscow in 2011. Um, so my father's museum and its unique collection currently remains the most authentic exhibit of Jewish life in Russia. And so when my father's uh, team of researchers started bringing artifacts from the outskirts of, of the former Soviet Union, um, such as um, cookware, furniture, and religious items, I discovered, actually I discovered that from them that there were still living people behind these objects. And, um, 
And back then I graduated from School of Visual Arts and was looking for a new theme for my, for my next film, uh, apart from my thesis film. Uh, so I decided um, to meet these people and um, it, it didn't came in the beginning and it didn't came at once. So, but gradually and slowly, I decided to tell the unknown story of the Jewish settlements behind the Iron Curtain. So that's how it all started, and with with the and the first contacts of of the of the characters were given by by these researchers. Um, so, but by by the time I started filming, the shtetls were almost um, emptied of the Jewish populations. Um, so those who who didn't die of old age already immigrated to the West uh, in the mid '90s or in the end and 90s so I made lots of trips all over all over Ukraine and Moldova um, looking for the characters for the for the last bearers of of, uh, of the Yiddish culture and um, and was fortunate to find some fascinating characters who and these first characters were non-Jewish so uh, and when I when I started except for for the rabbi he was actually one of the first people I met in, in Chernovitz. So, uh, but um, interviewing these sort of like lo lonely um, locals, I, um, I kept hearing about the, obviously about their former Jewish neighbors. And that's how I um, decided and decided that my search had to be expanded to Israel and the US. So, and that's how I uh, went to find my uh, US based and Israel based characters. It was a very, it was a kind of slow process. It's, it's really amazing how, um, you know, because that is part of the story, really, the, the immigration to Israel and to the US and um, and how that is still connect, how people still connect back to um, to their to their home, to their roots, and you you capture that beautifully. Um, one of the you know I do want to get to the rabbi because that's sort of a fascinating little little story within a story there I think. Yeah, yeah. But but before we get to the rabbi, yeah. um, I had a couple just a couple of questions about the movie. One is. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of scenes where where you where you the, the landscape in the movie is just gorgeous it's just beautiful and you use the landscape brilliantly um, but I also noticed you 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 go to a lot of birds there's a lot of scenes where there's flocks of birds or just a bird and I was just I was curious about that did it have did that have any spe special meaning was there any symbolism there I think they sort of play as a metaphor of of um, um, empty nests uh, or um, or flying away or or just like in case when you see cranes uh, in the nest, it, mm -hmm. these these two lonely cranes uh, sort of is a metaphor or of of this Ukrainian couple left. Uh, behind and with their just with their nostalgic memories of their neighbors. But besides that, I'm also a bird nerd. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, we have doves on our terrace here and we, we, we feed them from hand. So, um, oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was, it and was give, beautiful. and give them, and give them names as well. And, <laughs> And we have one that we actually raised, and and uh, and he sort of keeps coming back to us every morning. So, oh, that's yeah. amazing! Especially in New York, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, what what are your thoughts about? Um, it, it was just so fascinating to see the these the the couple, especially. Um, keeping the the Jewish traditions, and you, you know, even touching the mezuzah as he walked into the house, um, and sort of blending their own tradition 
with the Jewish traditions that they that they were surrounded with and kind of grew up with. Um, what what are your thoughts about um, you know part of our work at Action is working in some of the smaller shtetl communities that are that there are still some Jews in and trying to keep Jewish community and trying to keep that um, a placeholder for that history. And um, what are your thoughts about sort of these beautiful um, eccentric sort of elderly non-Jews taking on this responsibility of, of honoring this history and keeping this history alive. That was actually quite, quite amazing to see. Yeah, I don't want to upset everybody, but um, but the but um, Valodia, the hat maker, has passed away, and actually, um, I have only three living characters uh, at the moment out of nine. Wow! So I got I got really, I managed and was fortunate to get really the last glimpse of this world. So. I mean, even 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 Valodia, even I mean, like they're they're all gone, and 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 it's vanishing. So, um, and it's very hard to preserve Jewish history uh, in these remote places. Um, so it's not it's not it's not much preserved by by those who left, obviously, because they they went away and started assimilating in in. In the countries where where they went to, um, um, I don't know. I I met some people while filming uh, who would occasionally come back, um, you know, on rare occasions, and they would give money to um, to support the Jewish cemetery or to, or to or, or or their family bur burials, uh, but there is not much, you know pilgrimage going on in these places apart from um from Jewish Orthodox pilgrimage but that's another story that's something right. happening in Uman probably right. you've heard of that that that's another another thing right. um and the film doesn't doesn't cover it uh so I was more trying to picture and to show the world of of Soviet shtetl Jews and where yeah. they and where where they gone yeah. Um, so, um, and I think that, um, yeah, you, I, I've met some locals who were trying to, to save, um, Jewish artifacts. Um, actually in Chargard, there was, there was a Jewish woman in her mid fifties. Um, I didn't end up, uh, um, I didn't end up actually, uh, including her in the film for various, for, for like, let's say structural uh, reasons, <laughs> because you have to pursue structure in the film. So, but um, she, she, she lives, she still lives in Chagard. Um, she's in her fifties uh, and she lives in a Jewish house that is like century old. And um, she lives next to the synagogue that you see in the film. And uh, she tried saving Jewish objects uh, like wooden cupboards and and cookware, uh, things that she actually found in these Jewish houses that you see in the beginning of the film that uh, Valodia, the hat maker, uh, talks about, and um, she kept these things uh, in a in an auto repair shop, like mm. on the second or, or, or on the second floor of the auto repair shop, and she was she was hoping to attract tourists from Kiev and, and uh, foreign tourists as well. But her initiative, like nothing came out of it. And uh, she ended up donating her collection to my father's museum. And this is how they, they got these objects and they restored them and they would soon exhibit them. But other than that, um, I, I can't say, I mean, like in, particularly in these small places, I'm not talking about big cities like Kiev, right. uh, but in these small places, it's, it's almost like it's, it's impossible. 
Uh, but the good news is that the that Shagard Synagogue is currently being renovated. They they man they they got a donation from possibly a, a former dweller, I don't know, from someone who was from Shagard, um, from Australia, surprisingly, because oh wow. Yeah, people left for different different places. Right. Uh, yeah. Wow. So I don't yeah. know if this answers your question. No, it, uh, it did. It, it did. Yeah, one of the communities that we work in has um, has literally, I think, like 10 Jews left and they try to get together for Passover. Um, and so they, they have like a little kind of Seder in a community center because there's really no other space for them. So it's, you know, some public community center. And they don't have a Haggadah, but there's some one of the one of the one of the members of this little community knows enough about the service that he can lead it, and everybody kind of follows along, and they each bring something for the for the seder, and um, and we you know we support we support that a little bit as well. Um, it, it, it's very hard for them to support this this lifestyle because. Um, um, it's important to understand that these places has have been historically like poor places and even Very the poor. Jews themselves were thinking of sending their people their their children to uh, get education in the bigger cities, cities of the Soviet interior right. so and 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 pretend when it was Soviet Union they most of most of the their children went to study um, in Moscow Kiev Kharkiv uh, like bigger cities. Yeah. yeah. So the question, you know, just because this is such a, 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 um, a present issue today um, and there is such a deep history of it um, in the Soviet Union and the former Soviet Union, um, when, you were, when you were traveling around and you were doing these interviews and having these conversations, did you experience any kind of anti-Semitism, um, any, um, any conversations or, or, or talks that you would consider difficult? Um, what was your experience with that? I was fortunately to never have met people like that uh, talk to me. Probably they exist and, and uh, they, I don't know, but the locals um, I met and I spoke with usually had very nostalgic memories of of of, of their Jewish neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not something you know ideal that I portrayed. It was something that I encountered, uh, and I think I think the memories they had sort of coincided with the time when these places sort of flourished. Uh, I mean, by flourished, I mean again that we we need to uh, to remember that these were like very very poor communities. Very poor. Uh, but even during the Soviet era, <clears throat> uh, Jews were a vibrant part uh, of this community and and a very important like a like a, a driving engine. So they were like Valodya. Uh, the, hat, the hat maker in the beginning, like he keeps saying that they were shoemakers, tailors, ice cream makers, and soda makers. So they pretty much ran the business, a uh, small town, small town business, and um, and the town life uh, depended on their crafts and their trade. Um, so really, the 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 the, the random lo locals that you see in the film. Like the lady who is who is laying in the grass mm -hmm. uh, with her goat in the field, <laughs> uh, uh, she felt really sorry uh, uh, that Jews left. And uh, actually, it was not. I, I just caught her. We, we were we, we were actually flying a drone over her goat, and and she was very she was disturbed and disturbed her goat and she was bothered by that. So I approached her and start talking to her. And I said that we were making a film about the Jews. And then I asked her the questions about the Jews. And, and she, she told me this 
touching story how she worked with the Jews and how she misses them and gave some, you know, like amazing sound bites that I used in the film. And, um, and you know, w w without the Jews, these, these places be became even more abandoned than, than they were, even right. because, you know, like even it, those people who were leaving were already very old. Right. But this is where this is this was their life and these these were their neighbors. So um, there was there was also another um, man that I met in Shargarod again, who was um, who was very sorry. Uh, he's not in the film, but I'm just telling you something that is not in the film. So he told me that it was such a such a shame that uh, the Catholic Church in Shargarod, as well as Orthodox Church uh, had undergone restoration, or there was there was also a, a newly built Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. uh, and that and that synagogue was almost collapsing at that moment when when I right. met him and it was deteriorating. So I don't know. I never. I mean, maybe I was lucky. Um, maybe I I was directed to the right people. Um, Obviously, I know that that this that, that anti-Semitism existed in in the post-Soviet um, space, but um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe when I when I was there talking to these locals, they were only left with with nostalgic memories of the past. Nice. Um, so my my last question before we we look at the question and answer in the chat, and I, I encourage people if if you have a, a question, please um, please use the question and answer in the chat, and we'll we'll be monitoring it and looking at it for your for your questions as well. Um, but I am so curious about the rabbi and all of these, uh, you know looked like a whole stream of non-Jews who were coming and wanting, you know, they were saying, write it down, put it, put it on that little piece of paper. Um, they were so invested in him and, and, and he seemed to be invested in them too, asking questions and, you know, taking on their, their sorrows and their burdens. Um, so I'm, I'm so curious about about that relationship and and how that came to be and and what the backstory is for that. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I, actually, it, it's it's a pretty crazy and pretty weird scene, and uh, one of the weirdest scenes that I uh, uh, got to film so far in my life. Uh, because it was obviously much longer and, and uh, um, we filmed it for probably several several days. Uh, and um, yeah, th th this uh, Rabbi Noe, uh, he had um, a, he, he hadn't enough of, of Jewish congregation at his synagogue. Uh, because actually in Chernovitz there were two synagogues. So it's like in that uh, old um, Soviet um, Jewish joke uh, uh, that there are two synagogues in one, uh, in one you pray and in the other you, you never step your foot in. So actually among, among the Jews that were still living in Chernovitz, uh, Noah's synagogue was considered as I remember one Jewish lady telling me that that his synagogue was was like non kosher uh, because there was another <laughs> because there was another synagogue with with, a, with an Israeli rabbi that was right and uh, since no had this uh, kind of like um, non Jewish uh, reception his synagogue was not right. Uh, but this Jewish lady didn't know that, that the tradition actually goes back to like centuries ago. So it's, it's, it existed for 200 years. And traditionally non-Jews came to see tzaddiks, the wise men or rabbis to, uh, so they could 
pray for their troubles. And I think that even, even, Noah, even, even uh, Rabbi Noah himself didn't know that this, this tradition existed before him. That was my take on it. But um, uh, yeah, and, um, and I remember reading in one of the sources that was supplied to me by my father's researchers that um, the non-Jews um, believed that in some, that believed in some cases that Jewish God helped better. In some other sources, uh, uh, some other sources mentioned that non-Jews turned to rabbis to jinx their neighbors. And so there were, there were different reasons why they were going to rabbis. But um, apparently, apparently, yeah, this worked for them. And it was always a paid uh, kind of um, tradition. So they paid for, for the rabbi to pray for them. But even again, even, even this uh, tradition is now over, we could say, because um, uh, Rabbi Noah also passed away. So oh. this, this, if you go to Chernovitz nowadays, you cannot find this anymore. Hmm. So again, I was, I was really, and maybe when I was filming that, I didn't realize that I was literally filming something that it's going to be gone in, in a year or two or several years. That's um, really quite amazing when you think about it, that you were, that you captured history like, uh, like that, that, um, yeah, that's, per, that is, um, and not knowing that that's what you were doing, like that, you know, that, that is, it was a, it was a very, um, long process because, um, I, uh, I mean, well, to be honest, I didn't know from the very beginning what my main thing was. And it, it's not usually that this thing sort of appears and it, right. it, it's some, some way, some way, I don't know, made through uh, my editing process, I kind of finally uh, got what this film was about. And it was about, obviously it was about neighborship and, um, neighborship during during different times during yeah. and uh, and these and and how Jews and non-Jews lived together during you know it was sometimes a, a deadly embrace and uh, and we know we all know of these times and uh, and I had to talk about these times too because with many of my characters this ho holocaust was a watershed moment of their lives so I would come to an interview, start talking about, um, about something because I was, in the beginning, I was, I was more interested in, 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 in some things that were happening before the war broke. And uh, like, because the, all, all of the traditions were mainly practiced before the war. After right. the war, they all went um, sort of like underground. Right. And, um, and, uh, and they all, uh, and most of the characters, especially those who stayed in these, sh in these small shtetls, they would uh, open with, uh, with their Holocaust stories. They would not even listen to my questions, uh, <laughs> to my questions about the pre-war time. They would start with their stories because these were the main stories of their lives and very, um, sad ones and, and horrifying. And stories that they, you know, really have not had a chance to talk about. It's the, the Ukraine Holocaust is, you know, the, the former Soviet Union, Soviet Union Holocaust stories um, are not well. Known, yeah. It's something well that known. is not well known in the world and here yeah. in the US as well. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and this story probably needs to be told um, with another yeah. film, uh, but um, I, I felt uh, obligated to tell their stories as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that was because it, because so it was it, like I said, it was a watershed moment 
uh, yeah. for them. And I sort of like structurally in this film, and I don't know if, if the audience can, um, can see this and can relate to this, I um, divided the film into three parts, sort of pre-war times, then war, meaning Holocaust, and then after the war and all that sort of at the background uh, where these people are nowadays, what are, how they live and uh, what their memories of shtetl are. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, um, the, the timeline is, and the way you go back and forth in the timeline is the production of that is really well done and very seamless. You know, sometimes I, I watched the movie a few times and each, sometimes I had to like, Think to myself, okay, where where is she in the timeline? Is this is this you know is this a are they talking about before after? Because um, because it is so fluid, you, you know. It's um, their their the history is so real and immediate to them um, that sometimes I had to to stop for a second and think, okay, where are we in this fluid mm -hmm. timeline of things? Um, so we do have a comment from Mary. I want to, I just want to read that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary says, what a lovely film. It's such a mosaic. I am so sorry to hear that the hat maker has passed. The scenes with he and his wife are so poignant. All of the characters are fascinating. Um, and this is a great question. How did you find them? The, and, and she also brings up the converted man in Israel is such a complex character who is so full of joy. Um, and sorry, this is this is uh, more of a series um, rather than of comments rather than a question. But I think there are two really good questions in there. How did you find all of these characters? Um, you know, how did how did you get introduced to them? Who who introduced you to them? You know, was it was it just did you happen upon them like the woman in the field, or were were they sort of more mm -hmm. planned introductions? And then we haven't talked about the man in um, in um, in Israel, and he he is a definite character. So I'd, he's a great one to to lift up a little bit and talk about. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sadly he just passed away a few months oh. ago. Yeah, um, we've been really friends with him and. Um, and he's he he's he's a great um, a great character and a great man actually. Um, so how how did I find them? Uh, well, first of all, like I already mentioned, I uh, the the, fir the very first contacts that I received I received from my um, father's research team because these were the specialists in in Yiddish studies and uh, back in back in, in the beginning of of the year 2000, they were um, traveling around around the, the around these places around Ukraine and Moldova, uh, collecting um, collecting their information that they needed for their Jewish studies, and they were talking to these very people. So um, not every, I mean, like in the film, uh, eventually there is. I guess there's only uh, there's only Slava uh, Farber, the one who um, returns to his uh, family house in the end of the film, and um, and uh, Rabbi and Rabbi Noich. I must confess that I haven't included um, lots of people that I interviewed. I interviewed many more, and. Um, but this material would go to my father's, would be a part of, of, uh, of video uh, kind of, um, um, would, would be in like in kiosks in, in video. Uh, oh, nice. a, yeah, yeah, for my father's museum. So this won't be uh, gone. Uh, but again, the characters that I chose, the nine characters I chose, every character sort of um, serves a purpose in the film and tells a particular story that I wanted to tell through them. Right. So, um, 
So the, the first contacts uh, came from my father's researchers. Um, but but then, you know, like when, when you start making a film and when you dig into it, uh, in, into, into the theme and you, you start looking, you do the research <laughs> and you find, for instance, for instance, uh, Vladimir, uh, uh, the, the, the character from Israel, uh, I found his story online. I just, I, I, was, I was looking um, up Kopaigert, the place he comes from. Um, and um, I just came across this story and then, um, and then we found him in Israel and, and he was alive and he had all his grandchildren and children and they were all Jewish. So it was, um, it was a great story. Um, and then I kept yeah. sort of uh, coming back to him and the US based characters, I don't even recall how I found them, but it's like, you know, sometimes it could, could have been a word of mouth. So somebody, somebody knew I was making this film and then somebody would tell me that there is this, um, there is this mandolin player who, who was back then 90, uh, I think I first met her when she was 90, 96 or 97. Mm -hmm. uh, you should definitely talk to her. And then we became, great friends <laughs> with Emily, um, who obviously uh, passed away. She, uh, by the time I was, I was meet through my editing process, she, she turned 99. So, um, and it's very sad that um, most of them didn't live up to seeing the film, which is, which is a shame because it took me so many years to, to edit it. Not so many years, but but some years. <laughs> right. Um, the woman from was it Baltimore? Who um, or Maryland? Who uh, Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Um, who made the stuffed gefilte fish? Was that that those scenes were were just precious? Um, the way she. <laughs> the way she interacted with the fish the way, and, she, the way she yeah so reassembles just... reassembles the fish yeah yes that was yeah. my first my very first time seeing uh seeing the way the way she cooked it and reassembled <laughs> sort of <laughs> uh and then I obviously had to try it um yeah but uh for example uh I got to know her through her son who was who was a restaurant uh, owner and a friend of my dad back in Moscow. So, and when I mentioned uh, sitting in his restaurant, uh, mentioned that I was making this film, he said, oh, you should talk to my mom. Uh, she lives in <laughs> Philadelphia. She would, she would tell you everything and she would cook for you. And that's how I ended up in Philadelphia, um, talking to Sophia. Mm. Wow. And we're, we're, we're also still we're still friends with her and I um, and I keep in touch with with those who are still alive um, yeah it sounds like it was a very personal experience for you um, is this typical of I mean, I mean I know this is your first full feature but is do you do you know if it's so typical to become so connected with oh yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah um well depending on the characters but um yeah most of the time and it's not it's actually it was not my first feature because my my thesis film was my first feature, oh, okay which I already cut down to sort of mid-length film but um but yeah uh and uh, I'm still I'm still in in touch with with that character as well, with my thesis film character. Wow. Yeah, it's great. It's like collecting collecting people along the along the way. Um, so we have a couple of couple of questions. Um, Ethan says, please also tell us about the man who was revisiting his old neighborhood from his childhood. That that was a very interesting. That the hat was still there, and yeah, um, that was and, it, so and it's again, and it's again, it's a, it's such a shame that um, 
you know, like um, time-wise, I didn't have enough time, enough film time to uh, show that and to actually include everything I filmed with Slava. Uh, because Slava is a Yiddish singer. Ah. And uh, yeah, and we actually went together to Chernovitz where he was singing, where he was performing Yiddish songs in front of the um, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish community uh, and Jewish community center. Um, again, for various editing reasons, it, this didn't um, make it into the film because I, I had to decide that I had to leave only one character from Chernovitz and that was Rabbi Noek. So uh, in some earlier cuts, I had other characters who were actually singing to Slava's performance and singing these Yiddish songs. Oh, and obviously wow. Slava was very, very upset about the fact that I didn't include his performance and that there, was, that there was only this tiny bit uh, of him singing in front of the uh, Moldavian couple of his former neighbors. But he's a, he's, he's a great guy and he lives uh, now in um, Baltimore. Baltimore. He, he immigrated and um, I think he's available for performing in Yiddish. <laughs> That's good, to, that's good to know. That's good. Yeah, yeah, good seriously. He seriously and he's he's great. And he was from from what he told me that um his his um grandmother and his mother uh, and his I think his grandfather also they they were all singing these Yiddish songs and that's how he learned them and that's at some point in his life uh he decided to preserve these songs and he released a couple couple albums so and in Moldova he's 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 a pretty famous Yiddish singer wow. although yeah but but now he he resides here so yeah so yeah. but uh, from what I know he's um he performs in 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 Jewish community centers very nice very nice yeah um, so we have time for a couple more questions. And um, what, one more question that I have is this, the museum that your, that your father has, where exactly is that? Um, it's in Moscow. It's, it's in, in Moscow. Moscow. It's in Moscow. And um, uh, yeah, it was founded in 2011. So it's a pretty new initiative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is another, uh, another Jewish museum, but my father's is much smaller, but it has a, a much um, richer, I would say, collection uh, because uh, they've been bringing different stuff, including, including I don't know um, what they were, they were bringing like um, wooden door, wooden synagogue doors, wooden, wooden benches, um, sort of like saving them from, from being, uh, you know, gone right. and um, gone forever because from these from these remote places and from um, sort of collapsed synagogues, and um, but they are um, now with COVID th these uh, um, changes th th these plans have uh, obviously changed, but they were they were planning to. Um, they were actually constructing a traveling exhibition, uh, which included uh, a Jewish house um, with all the artifacts, uh, including the uh, the wooden uh, cupboards with with carved uh, wooden lions uh, that were rescued mm. by 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 this woman from from the Jewish houses in in Shargard, um, another part of the exhibition is um, is synagogue, and then the and then Korchma. I don't know how you translate Korchma, like um, I don't know, like Jewish um, restaurants. No, not, not probably not. So I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a very ambitious project of this traveling exhibition, and maybe one day it's going to reach the U.S. too. 
That would be fabulous. That would be yeah. amazing. Um, so we got a couple of, um, so what's the name of the museum? Is it just the- It's called, it's called the Museum of Jewish History in Russia. Okay. Uh, I don't know, I could, I could probably share. And they have a English version of the website. It's M-I-E-V-R dot R-U. Right. Somebody posted that Korchma might be translated as in. As in, in. yeah. Uh, as an in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. And the a couple, the last couple of questions are, um, so why Shargord? Char um, mm -hmm. And if it was a pointer from the Yiddish research, researchers, why did they choose it? Um, though Volodia I think, I think, did not seem to be a Yiddish speaker. Uh, no, uh, he was he was not. Uh, so what was the question again? Why I chose why, right? Yeah, why that? Why? Uh, because I, I, I don't recall honestly. Because I think that in the first place it was one of the most preserved shtetls in Ukraine, yeah. and actually, um, uh, this woman that I keep <laughs> coming back to, uh, she had a plan to sort of uh, uh, attract foreign tourists to Shargard because the streets, this, these these couple streets that I that you see in the film are actually uh, the most probably preserved. It's like it's like a shtetl. It's like 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 you said before we started. It's like going back to a real shtetl. And uh, mm, the, these were hand, hundred year old houses. Still like they were lopsided, but they were still there. They right. were collapsing, they were deteriorated, but they were still there. And that's how she wanted, her plan was to attract uh, tourists and to show them around around the shtetl and then sort of finish with her museum. But um, I don't know, maybe, maybe she didn't, she didn't find uh, investments or I don't know, this didn't happen. And then the last um, question that we have uh, is, have you done screenings? This is an interesting question. Have you done screenings for former sh sh shuttlers sh not included yeah. in the film? And what has their response been? Uh, it's a shame, no, I didn't. Uh, there was supposed to be a screening. Um, well, surprisingly, um, Ukraine and Ukraine festivals were not interested in my film, except for one festival, which is which was was um, very small. The and um, but I don't know for some reasons um, and Israel too, so to say, yeah. uh, they just um, rejected. Re I mean, like during the rejection process, they rejected my film and. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe this theme that I touch on uh, in the film is still painful and um, I mean, I mean the Holocaust. And yeah. um, and I don't know, maybe they're not they're not ready yet to, but this maybe I'm just I don't know. I really don't know. But um, there was supposed to be a screening. Um, one screening where I was planning to invite um, non-Jewish uh, characters. But again, Valodya the hat maker um, passed away. So there's only his, la his wife left. So I don't know even, it was, it was just for her probably. And she has no internet and nowhere to, so it, it's, it, 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 it was hard. I mean, like, it's a shame. No, I didn't, in short. Not yet, at least. It's still time. You, and, you know, and, and, you know, it's hard to travel right now. And it's hard to, it's hard to, uh, some of these things. It, it, it seems like in Ukraine, things, doing things that seem to be easy to do here 
can take, you know, five or 10 extra steps to get done, get done there, especially in some of the smaller communities. Um, yeah. So, so I, um, yeah, I, I hope to do this. Yeah. One day. So um, this was, uh, this was amazing. Um, I don't know if we have time for, oh, there's Joey. Good. Hi. Yeah. Um, I, I'll let you wrap up. Um, yeah. Just. <laughs> no, yeah, just Joey, if you have like... any questions, uh, you, you, you can ask them. <laughs> too. Well, well, I was going to say, there's just a comment that came in from uh, Lisa Gossels in the chat. Um, just, just glowing comments for, for you, Katya, in your film. She says, I just loved your film, Katya. It's a powerful and precious historical document and beautifully made. Bravo on your directing and cinematography. The stories you shared will always stay with me. I hope your film has a long life, including here in the US. So thank you very much for these, yeah. for these wonderful words. I just want to add one thing that uh, I also have um, um, in Stadler's Instagram account. So for more uh -huh. videos or for more um, animation, uh, uh, excerpts uh you could find me on instagram it's shuttlers and just like uh, rewind back and and i haven't been posting uh much lately but um uh, but but i will <laughs> i will post more uh, and and there are there are many wonderful um you know like short scenes that didn't make it into the film that was actually the, the feature around this uh, Instagram account to upload something that was not in the film. Some I'm extra, so, extra I, scenes. I think there's, there's, sorry, there's and, and even, an, a, and even, a, and even a, an extra animation scene that nobody, nobody actually asked me about animation. But I was gonna say, you, we didn't ask you about the animation. Yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. that would be so, if we have a half a minute, I would love to, yeah, love to hear sure. about yeah, how, absolutely. you know, because the, the documentary is, is about this, this history that, um, you know, this, this history that's, that's, that we're losing and it, and it has some, it has some, a, a very tragic past to it. There's pieces, there's elements of it, like you said, that it, that is very difficult. Um, and yet this animation is just beautiful and brilliant and fun. And, um, and the characters are, the art is just amazing. It's just, uh, there's just no words for it. So how, how did you imagine, like where, how did you come up with this? How did you imagine this? How did it be, how did, who created the art for it? It was just yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, I had the pleasure of working with, with an amazing uh, animation artist. Um, he, he's Ukrainian. Um, his name is Sashko, uh, uh, Sashko Danilenko. And, um, and in the very beginning, I was thinking or uh, illustrating some of the stories that I liked uh, about the film, in the film. In the film itself, but but then later on in the editing process, I realized that the the real stories of the real people uh, were much more powerful, and uh, I wanted them to be either on the screen or or in the voiceover telling these stories. Um, so, but we created a lot of animation, and I couldn't. I mean, like I just couldn't put it into the trash. So I came up with this um, with this idea of making the intro scene because I, I I anyway had to come up with with some introduction for those who who are not sort of in in the Jewish theme. And I was also aiming at uh, this kind of audience as well. Um, and was very, by the way, was was also very happy that my film played in, in, in non-Jewish film festivals, which was very important for me to sort of tell this story um, to those who are not in the context. So uh, we ended up making this intro and actually all of the characters uh, were drawn from, from particular references from uh, old photographs from my father's museum, from, from a real, real uh, Jewish traders or like 
these were either real people or they were um, sort of like referenced from, from some objects. Uh, so it's all real. And, um, and in the end, uh, I used the, the animation. There's this story that Slava tells, the story about the, um, how they used to make um, holes in matzah. And there is a, actually there, there is, a, a, there is an, an animation and you could find this animation on Stadler's Instagram, uh, okay. the full animation. I actually assembled it together with the uh, Slava's voiceover, like a separate, like a, like a separate piece, uh, extra piece. But in, in the end, on the end credits, we used it to sort of like a wrap up for, for the whole kind of, experience and um, yeah added some more uh he drew some more um more characters and um, yeah it was a, it was a fun experience as well it's your face just lights up when when you talk about this um, <laughs> it's clear that this was this whole endeavor was a labor of love and you you put your whole heart and soul into it that it that it's a part of you it's a part of you now and um they it, it's a brilliant it's a brilliant film um and such an Thank important important story to be told and I was, I was so glad to hear that you were also showing it in non-jewish festivals because I think that that is also so you know to, to educate um, the Jewish population about the story is important, but it's also just as equally important to educate non-Jews. And that, to, to have a movie that's accessible to everybody is, is, is not easy to do. And you've done it brilliantly. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this. For, thank you for very much. Taking this <laughs> on and making such a, an accessible movie about, about this hard, hard topic. Yeah. Thank you very much for your wonderful questions and uh, it was a great pleasure. Um, and thank you to both of you. Um, Debbie perfectly said, I think, I, I, it's hard to kind of follow up on that. You said it <laughs> as perfectly as I think I could have, but um, thank you, uh, Debbie, for you know all the work that your organization does as well as moderating tonight's conversation. Um, <laughs> And Katya, thank you so much for being here as well and making an incredibly impactful, this wonderful film. Um, we did post uh, the link to the Stettler's Instagram in the chat, as well as thank the you. link for the um, the Museum. Russian Jewish Museum. So okay. there's definitely some, there's a lot of interest to see in our audience tonight. So um, I think the conversation will extend far beyond tonight. Um, yeah, well, they yeah, actually they, they actually with, with the website they have their um their collection on display online. So so mm. those who are interested in in seeing these artifacts could um just go online and hit collection and uh it'll it's gonna pop up. <laughs> Wonderful. Um yeah. so yeah, um thank you to both of you for being part of the festival and for an incredible conversation tonight and uh, thank you to all of you who submitted questions and have enjoyed the film and make sure to tell uh, your family and friends to watch it because uh, we still have a few days until uh, the end of the festival until the 21st. Um, so yeah, yeah uh, sure. thanks to- Thank sorry, you, I, I just wanna say thank you very much for, for um, inviting me and, and I'm really honored uh, to be a part of a Boston Jewish Film Festival. Well, thank you. Thank hey, you so thank much. You and we so look much. forward to seeing uh, all of your films in the future. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, have a great night, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Good, good night. Bye. Thank you, Debbie. It was very thank nice you. talking this to was, you. Really this a was pleasure. so fun. Yeah, Best that was a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank night. you, Joey. Thanks, yeah, thanks no for problem. organizing this. <laughs> all pleasure. right. Bye-bye. Have a good night. <laughs>